So, Maha Yogi Maharaj, Dandavats, we are continuing our series of broadcasts. And can you tell where was the Guardian of Devotion Press situated? I, was it in the San Jose Temple? Well, we began our uh, publications uh, in San Jose. And so the, the, the temple at 62 South 13th Street, that was our headquarters. And so what w was the temple built around the publishing house? Or what was mm, the... The temple team? we had in uh, San Jose was uh, a wooden mansion on a quarter acre of land that was constructed by Bernard Maybeck. He's a very famous architect who built the Palacio de Bellas Artes in San Francisco, California. You can see it on the Google. It's really a beautiful building. And uh, finally, our printing press was physically housed in the garage behind the, uh, the temple. And we constructed some living quarters for the devotees also behind the temple. But in the beginning, uh, what we did was mainly pre-press production. We did the uh, editing typesetting. In those days, uh, we didn't have desktop publishing. So we did typesetting, stripping. We had to photograph the uh, uh, layouts and then create negatives. And from the negatives, a plate for the printing press, put that on the printing press and pr physically print the books. We printed, I, I think we began physically printing our uh, own books with uh, uh, Sri Guru and His Grace, but Goswami Maharaj, uh, he'll know. Uh, the search for Sri Krishna was, uh, we farmed that out. He went to uh, a pub publishing house called R. R. Donnelly and Sons, which was uh, responsible for the one million copy run of the Bhagavad Gita for Srila Prabhupada. So he went to them dressed in his dhoti and his tilak, Goswami Maharaj, and he said, we're interested in publishing another book. And we, maybe at that time, really didn't have the money to physically publish it, but we did our best to sort of bluff our way in because our, our Donnelly, they don't turn on the presses for less than 50,000 uh, copies of your book. But we explained what we wanted done, and, and they said, yeah, great, let's set it up. And uh, The president of that company made a couple of phone calls and got us a, a smaller press in the Bay Area, and we printed 3,000 of the uh, original book. But before we did that, we went to a mom-and-pop organization and published a 16-page booklet just to see if we could do it. And that was mm -hmm. the, really the original uh, search for Sri Krishna. It talked about uh, read out Reality of the Beautiful. That was the introduction where, uh, you know, Sridhar Marsh is talking about rasa, you know, atato brahma jigyasa. Now is the time for searching into reality and what that is. But he, he points out that for the human soul, uh, the real search is for rasa. It's not for uh, eternity as such, but an eternal relationship with Krishna. So anyway, that was the history of... So the search for Sri Krishna, as I understand, you started with just a whole bunch of uh, cassettes with recordings of Sridhar Maharaj, but how did it unfold it? Like now we are working on an <coughs> archive. How do you collect all these fat and like... A yeah, that's a good question. Well, at, at that time Goswami Maharaj was uh, preaching on the basis of the cassette. So he'd listen to a cassette in the morning and in the afternoon preach that to the devotees and the next day listen to another cassette. So after a while he got a feel for what was going to be useful and he'd say, you know, I really like what Guru Maharaj was saying here. And then I might say, yeah, I heard something similar on another cassette. And in this way <coughs> we started listening to certain sections of certain cassettes, and then we we could see, all right, here he's talking about Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the uh, nectarine ocean of rasa. And here he is talking about rasa also, but in a different way. He's saying, uh, search for the divine. So we brought those together and tried to create something. Uh -huh. And 
uh, how did came the idea of publishing the other books? I've heard that the process of first book was like going back, going to India, going back, always consulting with Shidhar Maharaj. So it probably took some like years of your life. Yes, it did, in fact. Uh, I dedicated 10 years of my life to publishing these books. And we really put out about five major publications, so say two years for each title. And the first book, <coughs> we were establishing Sridhar Maharaj as someone who could speak on a very high level of Krishna consciousness and at the same time defeat the opposition. He could give something simple that an ordinary person could understand and at the same time take it to the highest level. So we begin the book talking about uh, the search for truth and we end the book with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself questioning uh, Ramananda Roy about the ultimate reality and the particular answers that Ramananda Roy gives uh, Mahaprabhu form the real essence of Gaudiya Vaishnavism which goes up to the highest level of service. So it's like a, a popular version of the Ramananda Samvada that Sridhar Maharaj was specialized in. Uh, the thing is, the, the actual book itself is synthetic. It's not really a pop. It's not a popular version of anything. What uh, Sridhar Maharaj gives is very concentrated. You know, like if you have really concentrated orange juice, you can make, you know, liters and liters of it. If you have a highly concentrated uh, orange juice, maybe you could make a swimming pool of it, you know? But what Hari Charan always used to say, and I forget what part of the Chaitanya Charitamrita that's from, but he, he always used to close every lecture that he gave. He would say, Ek Bindu Jagat Dubai. One drop of this can satisfy the universe. That means this is so concentrated that if you come in contact with it, it will purify the universe. So. The search for Sri Krishna is like that. It's very highly concentrated uh, devotional nectar, if you like. And just by a little taste of that, it will satisfy you, it will transform your life, and then you will go out and transform other people's lives, and gradually uh, the transformation will be total. Yes, I would like. <laughs> That's how we felt. Uh, and talking about the opposition, uh, there is very famous moment uh, when Sridhar Maharaj was meeting Srila Prabhupada when he just first time came from America. Oh, the, the disciple of Saraswati Thakur who came from England. And he brought like 10 questions that couldn't be answered by him from the Europe. And Sridhar Maharaj, he just cracked them in like half hour. Bon Maharaj. Yes, Ban Maharaj, uh, when he returned from London, he was uh, chagrined that he was unable to properly satisfy the opposition he met. And he expressed this to Saraswati Thakur, saying, they had questions I couldn't answer. And then Sridhar Maharaj stepped forward and said, what are those questions? I can answer that. Um, and it's true, he could answer that, and he still does. And his followers uh, can answer those questions. Govinda Maharaj can answer those questions. Anyone who studies this line uh, can satisfy th the questions and doubts offered by even the latest scientists and philosophers who don't believe in theism. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Sridhar Maharaj was not available for preaching in the West at that time, or we might have a different history. Perhaps that was his nature, Sridhar Maharaj's nature was not so much with uh, standing before a public and promoting the, uh, the line of Krishna consciousness, but uh, he was more of a thinker. When he was called upon, he could satisfy any question. Yeah. So was this uh, search for Sri Krishna publication some kind of a message since Goswami Maharaj like brought Sridhar Maharaj to the West? Was this like the, well, the uh, fight back? You, you keep coming back to the same point, which is what, what's the real purpose of that uh, book? And so it's something like this. If you 
try to preach Krishna consciousness, uh, you'll meet opposition. And then you'll have some questions. And then you'll go somewhere and say, I couldn't answer these questions. How do I do it? That's what the search for Sri Krishna is meant for. That's Guru Maharaj actually answering those questions that Bone Maharaj had. The scientists say this, what do we, how do we answer, you know, how do we answer Darwin? How do we answer you know, fossilism? And he would say, well, uh, it's very simple. But how? Do we try to promote the idea that the earth was created in seven days or something? No. It's very simple. Uh, you have to think, does matter come from consciousness or does consciousness produce matter? It's a very simple uh, point. Uh, look at the order and structure and design in the universe. Does that come from nothing? How would that be possible? It doesn't make any sense at all. So uh, could a stone create uh, human consciousness? According to certain scientific points of view, that's what it's all about. Uh, Guru Maharaj uses the example of a stone. And, you know, the scientists, they don't exactly say a stone, but they're talking about chemicals, chemical combinations, molecular structure. Does that produce consciousness? Well, it never has. And with the best minds and the best computers and thousands and millions of internet connections all jamming at the same time to work out a scientific way to produce consciousness, they can't do that. So what's the, what's the solution of science? The solution of science is to tell you, well, we have produced really good products in the past. Trust us. In the future, we'll work it out. But it still doesn't solve the problem. On the other hand, Guru Maharaj points out that uh, anything that you see or feel or touch is a product of consciousness. And you know, if you, if you want the full argument, read the book. But is it easy to believe that a conscious mind can produce something? Yes, it is. We're, we're sitting in a house. Who made the house? Consciousness, you know? The cameras, the lights, the computers, all of this is a product of consciousness. Even the body that I'm inside of, it's been transformed by consciousness. So how consciousness works on material energy is a subject that scientists might dedicate themselves to understanding. But how matter can produce consciousness is, it's a failed paradigm. You can't get there from here. And Guru Maharaj discusses that in his chapter on uh, fossilism. So getting back to your point, uh, the whole idea of the book is to try to give the devotees uh, weapons that they can use for cutting through this kind of material Prejudices. ignorance, if you like. And in Search for Shri Krishna, there are like many chapters, but some of them, like Saint Scripture's Guru uh, and uh, the fossilism uh, and subjective evolution, they're unfolded in the, s the other books, like the second book, Sri Guru and His Grace. So how came the idea or necessity for the following books? Uh, well, these are uh, topics that the de devotees like to return to uh, again and again. <coughs> so, if our first book was to introduce uh, Sridhar Maharaj, to give an idea of his basic concepts, to promote Gaudiya Vaishnavism, to show that we do have a basis for what we're saying. It's not just speculation. Saints uh, and uh, what is it? Saints, scriptures. Saints, scriptures, and gurus. And gurus. Yeah, that's a chapter about the Bhagavad Gita. So the devotees are asking uh, Sridhar Maharaj, well, what is the meaning of the Bhagavad Gita, basically? And he gives a, a short summary of that. Well, Bhagavad Gita is important to us because here you have Krishna himself describing the philosophy. So uh, we keep coming back to that again and again, very naturally. But search for Sri Krishna gives you a taste. Sri Guru and his grace is a very different kind of production, all right? Um, there's some topics that really 
are not for the general public. Some topics are really more for uh, devotees who are experienced and want to go deeper. So if the search for Sri Krishna is more universal and uh, something you could translate into Hungarian and the people of Hungary would like it, Sri Guru and His Grace is a little bit more esoteric because it touches on the topic of uh, guru, who can be a teacher. This topic was very important to us because after the disappearance of uh, Prabhupada, uh, many people didn't know where to turn. They felt that they were becoming involved with people who are not qualified really as guru. So we wanted to understand more about the qualification of guru. Uh, who is gu really guru? What is guru tattva? Uh, this is a nice chapter in the Gaudiya Kantahara called Guru Tattva, where that's uh, elaborated. And guru Maharaj referred us to that again and again. So also, I think it was uh, the French writer Stendhal who said, I write books that I need to read myself. So at that time, I explained in our last interview, I was going through a spiritual crisis with my own guru-disciple relationship. And I was burning with a passion to uh, try to come to a, a conclusion, a closure, uh, to really connect with a qualified guru. And I felt that uh, other people would profit from my experience as well. So that's what drove me uh, personally to do my best to create uh, a text that would expose the, the importance of guru. And um, Goswami at the time was also fascinated by that, as many devotees were. So if the first wave of uh, disciples who came to Guru Maharaj had questions that couldn't be answered and they wanted some way to deal with the opposition. The second wave uh, started thinking, well, you know, maybe here in Sridhar Maharaj we have someone who's really a realized guru and perhaps he can help us sort out some of the problems that we have surrounding the whole guru issue. Guru Bhakti is a very essential part of Vaishnavism and Krishna consciousness. So it was fitting and appropriate that that was our second title. It's uh, one of the wise sayings that if you want to like really understand something, everything comes for service. You need to like put it out, like write it. But s it seems to me that most of the time you're working in America. But how did you felt empowered by Guru Maharaj and how you gained the qualification to properly represent him in all these books? Was he appreciate? I've I've heard he was really appreciating the work that was done on these publications. Well, uh, the system was we would go to India for a couple of months in the time when it wasn't so hot, which is probably oh, February, March, April. Uh, Gur Purnim. <coughs> By Gur Purnim, it started to warm up, and we would come home armed with uh, cassettes. So I would watch Guru Maharaj and sit his, at his feet and take notes and listen very carefully. And other devotees would do as you're doing. They'd make videos and tape recordings. But I did my best to really intently listen to everything that he said. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, <coughs> every day at the end of the day, I would come downstairs and devotees would be arriving from Calcutta or from Navadweep or they came back on the rickshaw from the Bajar and they would say, well, what did Guru Maharaj say? What was his talk? And so I would represent that to them. And then someone would ask, some, some other person would ask me, what did Guru Maharaj say? And I would represent that to him. So sometimes uh, we neglect the teachings of our uh, Guru Maharaj, and we forget certain things. But if you serve uh, the message, if you teach that or, or preach it, it becomes part of you. So in a way, by uh, listening to Guru Maharaj and then preaching what he said on the same day, and then maybe traveling back to uh, London or Germany, our, our flight would always take us 
through London, through Germany. Sometimes I went to uh, Budapest. I went to Vienna. I went to Stockholm. And the devotees there would be curious. What's the new thing? What did Guru Maharaj say now? So I would be representing that. By the time we got back to San Jose, California then, I would be familiar with 15, 25 hours of new lectures by Guru Maharaj on the subject that we were uh, trying to penetrate, in this case, Guru Tattva. And then we would start working on that book. So while it was still fresh in my mind, then we would go back to the cassettes and I could compare my notes and what I remembered with what he actually said. And then we would carefully try to look up the Sanskrit quotes, the Bengali, and assemble a chapter. And then we would think, okay, well, on a given day, maybe he spoke for 45 minutes and he touched on uh, the importance of selecting a guru for three minutes. But two days later, he talks about the same thing, and this time for 17 minutes. And we would try to put that together in an interesting way, and that, that could be a, a chapter or a chapter title. So your, your question is, how was I able to represent uh, Guru Maharaj's message? Well, we studied his message personally by questioning and listening. Then we saw how Govinda Maharaj, for example, dealt with practical matters. And also, he would correct us. He would say, yes, Guru, you know, Guru Maharaj is saying this, but you should also understand that. So that would form part of our, our consciousness about the message. And later we would listen to the cassette and try to correct everything and, and put it down very carefully. So you can see that book is a very good representation of uh, Guru Maharaj's teachings on the subject of, of guru. Who is a guru? Who's fit to be a guru? When can you leave a guru? How do you serve? All these different questions. It's a very dangerous book. Yes, that's why we like it. The most dangerous thing in that book is, well, there's a few very dangerous ideas. Right? One idea is um, that it may be necessary to have different gurus in different stages of your life. And that's a, that's a very painful, dangerous uh, thing to say, but it's true. When you're six years old, uh, maybe your mother is your guru or your father, or you have a, a favorite person in the elementary school, a favorite teacher in your primary school, and she's everything. She teaches you everything. She teaches you how to uh, put a plant, uh, put a little seed in a styrofoam cup that has some earth in it and put water on it. And, and you have to wait for days and the seed sprouts. And, and that's a marvel. It's a wonderful thing. And so this teacher, she's everything to you. She takes off your shoes when it snows outside, takes off your boots, you know, and, and puts them in a warm place and tells you it's time to go to sleep now. But later, you have to go to a more advanced school and perhaps they teach you the history of your country, geography, science. But even that will be a simple idea. They give you a simple idea of science. They tell you that uh, this is the velocity of a falling object. And later you go to the university and they say, well, in quantum physics, velocity is more difficult to work out. So you leave behind Newton and have to embrace Einstein, and it's a, deep, it's a deeper conception. So throughout your whole life, you're accepting different gurus. At one point, if you tell your teacher in the school, well, my mother said this, sometimes the teacher will say, your mother was wrong. And that's a conflict. How, do you, how can I accept that my mother is wrong? She's my guru. Hmm? But your elementary school teacher will say, well, maybe she was, and they try to adjust things. In the same way, even in Krishna consciousness, when we're young devotees, we meet some devotee in the Harinam Kirtan party, and he tells us, uh, chant Hare Krishna and be happy. It's cool. It's ecstatic. It's a good vibration. And you accept that person as your guru, and you think, they know everything. They know what prasadam is. They know what Radha Krishna is. They know what the Bhagavad Gita is. They know Sanskrit. They know everything. 
But it may be that later you find out that this person is really the man who sweeps up the kitchen in the temple, and he's not really the highly qualified devotee that you may have thought he was, and you accept uh, some sannyasi as your uh, spiritual guide. But then later he tells you, actually, I'm not the one. The real guru is Avadut Maharaj, or Govinda Maharaj, or Sridhar Maharaj. So there's a constant evolution in your uh, relation, guru-disciple relationship and that may involve uh, seeing your absolute guru from a relative point of view at one point in your life. And that's a very disturbing thing. So th there is dangerous material in the search for Sri Krishna. Another incredibly dangerous idea is the idea of the Shiksha Guru Parampara. And also there are other free books to continue the uh, light run through for the whole series. What, what was the let chronology let me of go, the Let me lesson. talk about the Shiksha Guru Parampara yes. because that's what I just brought up. Shiksha <laughs> Guru Parampara is, is it's fascinating because uh, the word shiksha, actually it's, you know, probably in Bengali they don't say the S, it's, you know, like Lakmi, shikha, you know, they don't really pronounce it that way, but uh, it means instruction. So there are some uh, paramparas, you know, or disciplic lines that formate, uh, they formulate their line on the basis of, um, well, there's the sun god Vibhasvan and after him uh, uh, Ikshvaku, and then Manu, and then Vyas, and our line comes directly, you know, from that. Uh, one guru initiates a disciple, and he initiates another disciple, and he initiates another disciple, and that man is my guru. So I'm the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna himself. My line goes directly back to him. That's a particular point of view. Um, in India, that might be more represented by the Ramanuja line or the Madhva line, because the Acharya of the Ramanuja line, he'll say, well, my guru was initiated by the student of the student of the student of Ramanuj, who was the original. So you think, well, okay, this is a pure product. What I'm getting is pure because it's, it's received. It goes from father to son to son to son to father, to son, like that. Um, India is a fascinating uh, civilization because in a sense, it's an unbroken civilization that goes back to the beginning of time where if you find a wood carver, you'll see that his father carved wood and before him his father and before him his father and somebody's following the same school. So this is a very appealing idea to us. Unfortunately, we're not talking about carving wood. We're talking about spiritual truth. So you can look at the Catholic Church, for example, and see that, okay, one pope gave it to the next man, and he uh, gave it to the next man, and he named the next pope, or they had a council, and the council nominated the next cardinal. There's a hierarchy. But the truth does not necessarily follow a hierarchy, and that's a very dangerous idea as well. It's something like in the history of music. Uh, there was Bach, J.S. Bach was a great composer, but who was his student? Well, maybe his children. He had, uh, there was a Christian Bach, who was a, uh, one of the children of Bach, was also a great composer. You know, Johann Sebastian Bach. I may not be pronouncing it correctly for the German disciples. But um, if you look at the history of music, who is really the follower of Bach? Is it one of his children? No, it's Mozart. You can look at Handel, and he produced some good stuff. But really, if you want to see who's the next great light in classical music, it's Mozart. There's no question about that. He takes the... Uh, the principles of harmony that were used by Bach, and he extends them and creates something new, right? If you want to see, well, who's the disciple of Mozart, you can look at his music students and people who learn from him. 
And maybe Mozart himself will say, uh, Salieri here, he is the next in the line. He, he really understands my conception. But if you look at music, you have to say Beethoven. So it's Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven. Was Mozart an initiated disciple of Bach? <laughs> Not really. Did he take the principles of Bach and, and move them to a higher level? Absolutely. So if you ask Beethoven, who's the greatest composer in music, what does he say? He says, well, I am. And they say, well, but what about Bach? And then he says, oh, but Bach, he is music. He's not a composer, he is music. So in the same way, real spiritual truth, it may not pass exactly from one guru to one disciple in, in the way that we're told. And this is a revolutionary and a dangerous idea. We should, of course, obey the disciplic succession. And if, some, if our guru tells us, follow him, he has the idea. We should trust what he says. But in the end, these things will be judged by history. History will tell us, okay, the great follower of Bach was Mozart. So in the same way, if you look at the uh, disciplic succession from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you can say, well, okay, there's Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami and Raghunath Das. And after that, there's Kaviraj Goswami. And Naratam Das Thakur, was he initiated by Kaviraj Goswami? Well, not really. But who has the great idea? Who can really represent Gaudiya Vaishnavism after Kaviraj Goswami? In, in Bengal, it's Naratam Das Thakur. So there are those who say, no, you must follow the, the children of the Goswamis. But we don't accept that. So we have the Shiksha Guru Parampara. And this is another dangerous idea that's in the book. And I'm sorry, I don't yes. mean to uh, speak too much at length. No, sorry. I just, uh, it sounds like the one of the new flows that's uh, named the meritocracy. Like, you d like there was um, by the birth and judging people of other ways, but now they say it's meritocracy. How much do you do? Like how how much you benefit this, like the society or the guru, the parampara judged by this? Well, this like I said, it's for history to judge in a way. If you really look at the parampara and you say, okay, well, who succeeds uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur? It's still young for us to give the true judgment of history because only fifty. I don't know. How many years have passed since his disappearance? Uh, you would know. 41st. Is like when did he disappear? In the 1930s, I think. 41. Okay, so that's more than 50 years now. I think 50 because I was born in 1953. But 50, yeah. So something like 70 years have passed. And you can look at the line of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and say, well, who really succeeded him? Was it the man that he named in his will? Was it... Uh, somebody who, even though he didn't name him in the will, he told everybody, this man understands me. Because you can say, oh, the person who's named in the will, he's the important one. Follow him. Or you can say, oh, no, that's a legal document. Remember, legal documents have legal purposes. He's doing that for the management. The person who really understood him was, you know, so-and-so. But look at Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, and who really succeeds him? We, we think, I think, because I'm his disciple, of course, so I would say uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. He is the, the standout follower of Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, because I would not be sitting here today if it weren't for Prabhupada coming to New York and chanting Hare Krishna in Tom's, Tompkins Square Park in 1965. I wouldn't be here. He brought it to the West. He had that genius. He had the power. Um, as a consequence of what he did, uh, the, the waves of that ocean that he gave are still crashing on distant shores, like in China. Right now, China is just beginning to become interested in Krishna consciousness. That's uh, one billion human beings. 
You know, if one billion human beings decide, yes, you're right, Ek bin dude, you got Dubai. <laughs> one drop of this can satisfy the universe. Then that changes everything. But who initiated that was really uh, Swami Prabhupada. Okay? So if you look at Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, you have to say, all right, it's going in that direction. But you cannot discount uh, Sridhar Maharaj either. Because if you go to Prabhupada and you say, this is really great what you're teaching. Where did you get this? Are you a big follower of Saraswati Thakur? In his humbleness, Prabhupada will say, well, you know, it wasn't possible for me to attend every lecture given by Saraswati Thakur. I met him a couple of times and he told me, if you ever get money, print books. But I lived in Calcutta and I had a pharmacy in Calcutta and upstairs from the pharmacy, there was this other disciple of Saraswati Thakur who had his ashram there, and that was Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Dev Goswami. And if you really want to know, actually, I learned a lot from him. So he is my Shiksha Guru. So you can see there's a very powerful electric current coming from these two great uh, gurus. And who will be the greatest disciples of uh, Prabhupada and Sridhar Maharaj, well, we have Govinda Maharaj. And the person best qualified to speak about uh, Govinda Maharaj is probably Bhakti Lalita, who's sitting here. Uh, so I won't uh, try and we're short on time. I'll just take some more questions. Yeah, so Sri Guru and His Grace, in the end, is the book for disciples. And when it's come to disciples, it's always like your choice and like it's up to you. You choose your guru for you that you will devote. And, concer and connected with this, we have a question from Kamala. Maybe let me read it. Dandavas Maharaj, you mentioned selecting a guru. It seems self-evident that the aspiring new devotee has no real understanding of guru tattva. Yet they need such understanding in order to discriminate between authentic and bogus gurus. So if they make a mistake in their choice, is that part of Krishna's plan for them? Or is it just due to their insincerity? Well, first of all, I'd like to say hello to uh, Kamala and, and Hare Krishna and Dandavats after all these years. It's good to hear from you. Anybody who's listening to this, by the way, um, or watching, uh, please send your comments and, and questions along because we want to hear from you. Um, this is a very fascinating question. How do you know a real guru when you see one? Well, you may have to make a few mistakes along the way. Uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, uh, in his book, The Life and Precepts of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he talks about ruchi. He says there's some kind of innate flavor that you can get from uh, Krishna consciousness, from uh, uh, being associated with a genuine Vaishnava line. And once you have a little bit of that flavor, you know what that is and you know how to recognize it. And sometimes it's stronger and sometimes you can find it more concentrated and sometimes it's very weak. So just like we know what pure water is, Everyone knows what pure water is. If somebody gives you a glass of water and they say, this water is pure water, and you drink it, and you taste something that's not really supposed to be there, it's a little bitter, it's a little salty, it's too sweet, then you feel like we're not really getting something genuine. You can understand, Krishna says, in fact, in the 10th canto, uh, the 10th uh, uh, chapter, of the Bhagavad Gita, he says, Raso hum, I am the taste of water. But more to the point, he's saying, I am rasa. See, so ruchi, rasa. You get a little flavor of the real thing, and you know it when you see it. You'll, you'll know it when you come across it. And so it may be stronger in some gurus than in others, or it may be absent completely in some gurus. So when you find the particular spiritual taste which comes with Radha Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, Bhakti, you can distinguish that. And you will find 
what is genuine, if you struggle to get more of that same taste. And if you come in contact with someone who gives you that, stick with them and see if they'll take you higher. And they may take you to someone who, who has an even more powerful uh, concentration of, of ruchi or rasa. And then you'll know this is really guru tattva. And on the other hand, if you find that it, what was at once strong is becoming a weaker and weaker signal, then you have to search out where is the true light, where is the true signal. Just like this uh, broadcast that we're doing is a radio uh, signal. Some people will find, oh, the signal's breaking up. This, uh, I'm not in a good spot. I need to move my uh, laptop to a closer Wi-Fi connection, right? So find where the Wi-Fi connection is the strongest. You will understand, oh, I'm connected. Wow, woo, this is a fast connection. And you will understand, eh, there's something here, but it's not so strong, but I'm getting something. Like that, uh, Guru Tattva will make itself known to you if you really search for it. I hope that helps you. Thank you, Kamala. Definitely. Yes, any other yes. questions from anyone out there? We, we, we're very happy to hear from you. Yes, the uh, next, actually, feedback, more feedback than a question came. The first part of it, I think that's limitations of the live stream. But Anushya is writing, Dandavas Maharaj, you may remember me from 62S 13th Street. South 13th Street, yeah. When I, when I was called Ananga. Ananga? Oh it is yeah. wonderful to see you and hear you after all these years. I Ananga don't have Manjari. a question now, yeah. but I want to let the end of the, of the question. She what? <laughs> That's it. She's sending her dandavats. Dandavats to you, Anang Ananga Manjari. Thank you for saying hello. I'm, I'm astounded. Uh, this connection with the, the devotees is bringing warmth to my heart and giving me oxygen and I can breathe. If the heart doesn't have oxygen, the heart dies. And so the association of uh, devotees, it's like oxygen. So getting back to the other question about Guru Tattva, if there's no oxygen in the room, you know. And you know when you can breathe. So find out the oxygen. Yeah. The end of the message came. I wanted to let you know how much you are bringing, how much joy you are bringing to my heart. Oh. As we say in uh, Mexico, igualmente. And going back to the first book published, Search for Shri Krishna, one of the mem uh, memorizable quotes from it uh, is about uh, that when you go on the Krishna consciousness, uh, the road of Krishna consciousness, the um, search for Shri Krishna, you feel that your inner hankering it's being diminished, like it's being satisfied. It said, in this world we are getting this and this and this and everything, but still our hunger doesn't diminish. But on the road of the Krishna consciousness, it just gets satis you get the inner satisfaction <laughs> you were searching for so long. Yes. Is that a question? No, so is it? It's uh, just... Uh, Promotion of the books. So can we get uh, to say something about the last three books? Because there are some books of introductory meaning, but some books of like very deep, like subjective evolution of okay, consciousness. Okay, well, you know, we did the search for Sri Krishna kind of, we, we're thinking this will be an introduction. Of course, many people read that and say, this is too high, this is for the intelligentsia. We can't understand it. It's not an introduction. So then we thought, well, what's really introductory? The guru. Try to understand that. But we come from the Gaudiya Vaishnava line, and our real sympathy, our real loyalty is with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So the next book we uh, discovered was uh, The Golden Volcano of Divine Love. In a way, these books are also discoveries because 
Sridhar Maharaj has there in uh, Nabadweep Dam on the banks of the Ganges, and this is what he's giving. So if we listen, we find that he gives Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So the Golden Volcano of Divine Love, the title has to do with uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's inner feeling. Now, who is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? That's really the subject of our book. The idea is, we were discussing this, mor uh, this morning, uh, Sridhar Maharaj used to like the expression, die to live. Uh, it's Hegelian, thesis, uh, synthesis, antithesis. So uh, I asked Gopakishore, what's the greatest thesis? Supposedly, it's Krishna. No, it's not supposedly. We we believe that it is. You know, uh, we have it from our guru that this is reality, and I feel this is real. So, we can say, yes, the highest thesis is Krishna, God, Krishna. How is God? Is God an old man in the clouds who's too old to have a good time? He's just suffering. He's tired. He has a heart problem. He's got high cholesterol, and uh, he can't remember when he created the world very well because it was so long ago. Adam and Eve, now they're having a good time. So the earth was created for their pleasure, no? Mm, according to what we know, if you think about it, uh, Reality is by itself and for itself, so God must be having a good time. In fact, everything is for his pleasure. In Sanskrit, we call this purush. Purush means Lord, but it also means the subject. He's not the object. Prakriti means object. So the Lord, he's enjoying himself, his prakriti. The relationship between purush and prakriti, that's thesis and antithesis. Right? So, w if Krishna is the thesis, what's the antithesis? Srimati Radharani. So, you have Radha Krishna. You have the supreme positive and the supreme negative involved in some uh, constant relationship which is give and take on the highest level of divine love. When we say negative, we don't mean this in a pejorative sense. We mean this is the complement to the positive. What we find in the, in the positive is uh, power. What we find in the negative is love. So the combination of power and love, or the relationship between uh, the lover and, and the beloved. So now Hegel, he also talks about the master-slave relationship. And this is interesting because what he says is, if, if, if one is the master and another is the slave, what happens is sooner or later, by service, the master is conquered and the slave becomes the master. By serving the master, the slave has control over the master and the master becomes helpless. So Radharani's love is like that. It's so powerful. It overpowers God himself. And this is a, a strange thing to say because we're not supposed to promote slavery. But this is also in the, the Golden Volcano of Divine Love talks about divine slavery. But this is a Hegelian concept that when the thesis meets the antithesis, the relationship is so powerful, that it creates a synthesis. So what would be the synthesis? Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. S yes. Uh, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is, is metta. Metta means if you go outside yourself and try to reflect on how you're thinking, metacognition. So if Krishna, using his divine intelligence or will, uh, looks outside the Radha-Krishna relationship and tries to analyze it, what he will find is the Radha part is even better than the Krishna part. Why? Because through service, 
Radha is experiencing more ananda than Krishna. The one who serves has a greater uh, taste, rasa, than the one who's being served. You know, try it sometime. Be a sannyasi and accept service. And you'll find that after a while, it's dry, it's tiring, it's punishing. Whereas serving somebody, it's sweet, it's happy. So Krishna thinks, I want to find out about this. What would that be like? How could I, how could I try this out for myself? So he comes in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to discover what is service. And what he discovers is this is a higher position. So uh, Milton said, better to serve in heaven than to reign in hell. We prefer a service position. But the devotees are even more extreme. We say, I prefer, t I, I can serve in hell. It doesn't matter. Put me where you want. If I get a chance to serve Krishna, I'll be happy. So even if we have to go to hell to preach Krishna consciousness, we're ready for that. Gasai Maharaj sometimes refer to the neophyte devotees as uh, nectar seekers, uh, but um, on the Samadhi of Srila Shiddhar Maharaj, uh, it's Samadhi of love in separation. Okay, and this is a really good point, because many people, they come to Krishna consciousness thinking, wow, this is cool, get high naturally, you don't <laughs> need the psychedelic drugs, this is the new crack cocaine, you can just take this and whew, you can go to the top. Um, and what happens is it's true, you get this ruchi or rasa, if you like, that we were talking about before, um, which attracts you. But real realization on the path of Krishna consciousness, it has to do with service. And you're not serving because if you serve, you get ananda. It's not a give and take. It's not, I'm going to do this, and then I'll get that. You serve because you have to. Like real musicians, they're musicians because they have to be musicians. They don't know anything else. They can't make any money. They're not successful. It doesn't matter. That's what they do. They're musicians. Uh, it's their dharma. So if you have the taste for uh, Krishna consciousness, you have to serve Krishna. So ultimately, you're not interested in bhukti, mukti, or anything. All you want is to serve. You're not even interested in divine love. If you're thinking, well, let me see, if I do the sadhana bhakti, and I practice the ritual, and I, uh, I cook the prasadam, and I serve the devotees, then later I'll get something. I know I'll get something. I'll leave this planet, and I'll go to a higher world. And I hate this planet because it stinks, and everything here is terrible and bad. That's not a good attitude, see? You have to develop a service attitude where you don't care how terrible everything is. All you want to do is uh, serve. And that's a very difficult place to get to. But that's, that's what the higher uh, devotees are busy doing while we're trying to puzzle through our daily life. Yes. And yeah, I, I'm very, uh, as we say in Spanish, we have this word apenada or apenado. It means embarrassed. So I'm sitting here pontificating in a room with uh, 10 people. And uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the devotees here who are giving back to me what uh, I tried to give uh, years ago and perhaps lost to some extent. So I want to personally thank my interlocutor, who's off camera, Gopa Kishore for uh, creating this dialogue. Real truth often comes out through dialogue because if I'm only talking uh, and thinking that I have the truth, it's very stale. But if you can give me something back, there's more dynamic. And I'd like to thank uh, Bhakti Lalita for her presence and for reminding us all of Govinda Maharaj, Amiya Krishna for travel arrangements, Aurora for the trip from Mexico, and Yuvati, uh, who, who took us to market and 
knows Chiang Mai in and out, and our director, Indu, uh, Indu Leka, Rama Kanta, who's behind the controls at the production. Uh, I can't see everybody. Lee Lavati. There she is. Lee Lavati, who's always expert in serving everybody. I don't know how she does it, but she's always there doing something. And uh, Annalina? Annalina Sundari. Annalina Sundari. Pavan Krishna. Pavan Krishna. Pavan Krishna who are making uh, the whole experience in Chiang Mai uh, really worthwhile. So if you're watching this production and uh, liking anything, please send your comments, uh, tell your friends, uh, watch the uh, Upcoming channel. series of our events. What is it? Upcoming the upcoming series of our events. We'll have only two more broadcasts, Monday, Wednesday. Next Monday, next Wednesday, we'll do this ad again, and then I will again. disappear. So goodbye, Chiang Mai, and goodbye, Hare Krishna. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> Anyways, we're very happy to come here and, and work with all of you, and we will work with you in the future, I'm sure. There is, yeah, there is, there is one part in the, at the uh, beginning of search for Sri Krishna where Krishna is shamelessly expressing himself and glorifying his devotees and Krishna consciousness. So I think in the following uh, series we can talk about loving search for sh for the last servant, which I think fits very good to your story. And we'll keep our viewers with this. So stay tuned, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, and Vaishnavas of all ages.